We are members of this world. We live among the people of this world. We are part of the society of this world. And so easily we can be affected by that and not even realize. Example. In 2002, we moved to Ohio, and it was just as the Buckeyes were starting a national championship run in football. And I was on the bandwagon about six seconds after getting there. The whole city, the whole state was just euphoric about this amazing team and all they were going to do. And if you'd have watched me during games, you would have thought I was a lifetime Buckeye fan. Didn't plan on it happening. Definitely didn't plan on it happening. Just being surrounded by it, being involved in it, you just get caught up by it. Maybe another example. Let's say your job moves you to Mississippi. You're there four years and you come back. Not only does everyone here sound like they're straight out of the North Woods, they say that you sound funny, that you developed a draw. Didn't plan on it happening. It's just you were immersed with people who talked that way and it affected you. So, we live in a society that does affect us. Sometimes it's a little pointless things like that. But there are other things from society that can be very dangerous for us to buy into. And while a lot of things can go on that list, what we want to talk about this morning is instant gratification. Maybe the best definition of that is the bulletin cover. I want it all, and I want it now. I want my every demand met, and I want it done this moment. This always has been somewhat of a problem for people, but I think it's just been amped up and on steroids lately. Adults, think back to when you were a kid, you are sitting around the the breakfast table, and you saw the cereal box, and it said, send in six box tops and you get your your decoder ring or you get your free movie. So you cut off the box tops and you send them in, and how long did you have to wait? Six to eight weeks. You'd start checking the mail at four, but it didn't matter. It was always six to eight weeks. You got what you wanted. You were gratified. But it was a delayed gratification. You had to wait. Would our world put up with that anymore? Absolutely not. Maybe the best illustration of that would be Amazon Prime. You can order something in the same day, possibly. It'll show up on your doorstep. And if you're not same day around here yet, you will be soon. Think about groceries. You can fill out a form online, pay online, get in your car and your PJs, drive to the store, and some 15-year-old kid will load them in, and you're done in a matter of an hour. You didn't have to get dressed. You didn't have to get out of your car. And of course, the internet has changed everything. It doesn't matter where you are. Instant information, instant communication, instant entertainment, it's literally in your hands. It's gratification. You're getting what you want, but it's an instant gratification. You don't have to wait. In fact, we're so accustomed to this that if you have to wait an extra day for shipping or for some reason, heaven forbid, you can't get online, we freak out and act like society is crumbling. Now, is it really that important in matters like this? Shipping? Groceries? No. But adopting the instant gratification mindset in spiritual matters can be dangerous, if not deadly. To focus on this, we're looking at our second lesson, Paul's letter to the Philippians. Paul wrote this letter while he was in jail. And the Philippians, they were a young church full of young Christians who were surrounded by false teaching. So throughout this letter, Paul encourages them. In chapter 1, he rejoices that they're sticking to their faith and carrying on gospel work, even though he's not there. Chapter 2, he gives a beautiful confession of Christ and, and tells them to shine like stars as they hold that message out for the world to see and hear. And the beginning of chapter 3, he warns them about the dangers of all these false teachers. And then we get to our text. He starts by saying, Join together in following my example. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Well, what kind of example had Paul given to the Philippians? That nothing is more important than Jesus, his work, and his love. He was a model for them, an example for them of someone who had his spiritual head screwed on correctly, of someone who saw the big picture. So he says, I and fellow believers like me, that's the kind of examples you should follow. But then he contrasts that with some negative examples. As I've often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. What broke Paul's heart? That so many people wanted nothing to do with Jesus. 
And why not? Well, he tells us. He says their God is their stomach. Stomachs have appetites. Appetites need to be fed. Well, the people were thinking they were their own gods. They could do whatever they want. So what are they going to feed themselves with? Anything and everything. Money, sex, power, influence, temptation. You name it. The list is almost endless. The stomach, the appetite needed to be fed. And they were going to do whatever it took to do that. And Paul says their glory is in their shame. In order to feed that appetite, nothing was off the table. In fact, they weren't even ashamed or embarrassed about these things because the mindset is, I want what I want. I'm God, I have an appetite for something, so I'm going to do whatever it takes to get it. It was an instant gratification mindset. They weren't thinking about consequences. They weren't thinking about dangers. They weren't thinking about warnings. They weren't thinking about anything except right now. I want it all, and I want it now. I think Paul best summarizes this with the line, I have no idea what happened there. but And you have very bad short-term memory, so you're going to forget all this. There we go. Their mind was set on earthly things. Appetites, desires, glory. It was all about this life. Now, it's amazing how sometimes you read Scripture and you see how clearly it portrays our society. What we just read, isn't that our society? God being their stomach. Isn't that what our world is all about? Whatever you want, go and get it. Whatever is going to make you happy, absolutely, positively it is. And the glorying in their shame part. I mean, think about things now that you see, whether it's not even online, on TV. Stuff that you would have never have seen 30, 40 years ago. These things are shameful and disgusting or whatever. And yet people are now standing up and promoting these things as if they're virtuous. I could go on and on with example after example, but maybe one will help. You might not be able to see this, but this is the Freedom Tower in New York, and there's pink lights shining up. This was lit up after the New York Senate passed a bill that basically made infanticide legal. They were declaring it a victory for women that they could deliver their children, and then a doctor could make the baby comfortable and put it to death. We're celebrating that. Along the same lines, I think it was on Twitter a couple years ago, There's a a campaign called Shout Your Abortion. Now, 30 years ago, if somebody got an abortion, most of them probably would keep it kind of quiet. Now we're having campaigns to brag about it. And this is the one that stopped me in my tracks. I'm 23, and I've had three abortions. Yes, I have. Glorying in shame? God being stomach? We could go on and on and on with examples. But two things. What good would that do us here? And two, wouldn't it be very easy for us to be pharisaical, look down our noses and say, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that person. So let's take Paul's words and apply them to ourselves. And let's ask a few questions. Whose example are we following? Our brother in faith, Paul, or the society in which we live? Are we following, following Paul's example of delayed gratification, of faithful service, maybe not getting all we want, but faithfully moving forward because we know what awaits us. Is that the example we're following? Or are we following the world's example of instant gratification, do whatever you want, whenever you want, to get what you want? Maybe the simpler way to ask it is this. Are our minds set on earthly things or heavenly things yet to come? Now, just with that question alone, there's 200 different topics we can talk about. But I want to narrow it down to two. Two ways that instant gratification has caused struggles and difficulties in the lives of believers. And these two topics are a bit touchy. I understand that. But this is based on 17 years of working with God's people. One way instant gratification can easily harm a Christian or Christian family is in the matter of sports and especially youth sports. Now, believe it or not, I was once an athlete played football for 12 years, I've coached for six going on seven. I've seen a lot, and I've learned a lot. But what I've seen lately, in regard to youth sports, is that it's become an obsession, especially for parents. A lot of great lessons can be learned from sports. Diligence, hard work, teamwork, all those good things. But there's also very negative lessons that can be learned. And think about just the consumption of time that it involves. 
endless camps, select leagues that are gone like 18 weekends in a row, nationals for six and seventh and, and eight-year-olds, seven-day-a-week practice, a, a focus when the child is four years old, push, 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 push. All of that comes with a price, and the price is time. I know every parent wants to believe that their child is the next Patrick Mahomes or Steph Curry or Bryce Harper, but the reality is for most kids, sports stop after high school. Unless you count golf and bowling, which I don't. So why does it so easily become an obsession that this is the whole identity of a of family or of a person? Because there's the instant gratification of trophies and medals and victory on the field and everybody patting you on the back and saying you're the best or your kid is the, ne the next best phenom. So easily it's an appetite that needs to be fed. So again, yeah, a lot of positive lessons can be learned but also some very negative ones. And such an emphasis on this, it does come with a cost. Again, that cost is time. Are we focusing on delayed gratification with our young athletes? About working hard, especially as a Christian, knowing that you may not get what you want, but better is coming. Is that where our focus is? Or have we sold out for the instant gratification of immediate success and signings and pats on the back and medals? I'm not saying a balance can be done. I've seen plenty of families do it. But it is difficult. And it has to be based on two questions. One we already said. Are our minds set on earthly things or heavenly things yet to come? Does this emphasis on sports help them see the full picture of life as a child of God? So that's one topic. The other one I won't spend as much time on because we talked about it about six weeks ago. It's the whole phone, social media, online stuff. You know why it's so hard for so many people to put the phone down? Because it's instant gratification. You put something out there and immediately people are responding. And while there is some negative stuff, most of it is how great you look, how wonderful your kids are, how straight your teeth are. And it's easy for that to just feed upon itself. Just notice next time you're out in public, how many people are on their phones when they're with a group of people? I mean, you'd think they'd want the instant gratification of the people they're with, but instead, they want to hide. it's so easy to hide in that virtual world and just have, again, everybody tell you how great and how wonderful you are. And it's a self-feeding cycle, and in the end, it comes down to it's like a search for the almighty like. So I feel good. So I feel needed. So I feel necessary. But ask this question. How much of any of that stuff does any benefit for our lives of faith? I know there are some good things going on, whether they're prayers being sent or sympathy or empathy or believers are, are, are reaching out or they're contacting fellow believers and they're nurturing one another in their faith. I know that some of that's happening and that's awesome. But let's be honest, 95% of it isn't that. 95% of it is stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with our spiritual lives. And when that's not the case, what does it become about? It easily becomes about us. The appetite for attention and praise and validation. And when that is our mindset, then we're not thinking consequences because it's all about right now. We live in this weird world where things people posted or storied or whatever seven years ago are coming back to bite them. Racist things, sexist things, things a Christian never ought to say. But at the time, the person wasn't thinking that because it was the instant gratification wrapped up in what I want to do. So again, the questions need to be asked. Are our minds set on earthly things or heavenly things yet to come? Does this emphasis on technology help us see the full picture of lives as children of God? Now, am I the grumpy old man condemning youth sports and social media? Absolutely, positively not. But if unchecked, this easily could mirror what Paul was talking about in our lesson. So easily, instead of being about Christ, it could be about self. And when that's the case, everything can get screwed up. Then it's about earthly things, not heavenly things. Then it's about doing something that we know is wrong, but we don't really care because we're not thinking about the consequences. Then it becomes shifting our morality so we don't feel bad about what we've done. Then it falls into doing things we never thought possible in, in, in an attempt to feed the ego beast. It becomes about instant gratification. What I want right now instead of the delayed gratification of hum humble service as a child of God. 
But if youth sports or social media, if that's not your issue, you don't have to look hard to find something because we all have something. Something that tries to knock God off the pedestal in our heart. Something that tries to get us to exchange a glorious future for a very cheap now. Something that drives a wedge between us and our Savior instead of drawing him closer. We all have something. So what is your something? If it's not the stuff we talked about, what is it? Is it an addiction? Is it Six Commandments stuff? Is it gossiping? You know you and I know me, so we can come up with our own list. So where do we go from here? None of us can say we have not sucked up some of society's mindset of instant gratification, and I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, first and foremost, we come clean before our Lord. And what a great time to do that. Lent is a season when we understand what our Savior did for us. He marched to that cross. You talk about delayed gratification. He endured all that in order to remove all our sins from us. And they are gone. No matter how long we've given into these things, no matter how, how focused we've been, no matter how intentional we were, as we come to our Savior, they are gone. That is our comfort, and we pray that is our strength as well. So knowing we don't want to suck up what society says, what do we need to remember going forward? We know it's a struggle. What do we got to keep in our minds? Well, it's a very simple thing. We need to remember that no matter how great things seem here, it can't hold a candle to what is coming. Paul says it this way. Our citizenship is in heaven, and that is a huge deal. We are short-timers here. We are interlopers. We can say that we don't belong here. Heaven is our home. That's where we belong, and we belong there because of the work of our Savior. So maybe you're thinking, that, that's your answer? I, I'm tempted to just go for right now, and you're saying, well, keep your eyes on what, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ahead? Yes, that is the answer. A faithful service now until the glories of heaven are ours. And while that may seem a long way away, the fact that it comforts us and strengthens us right now is a reality. And to drive that point home, let's do a visual. I'm curious, did any of you happen to notice a string tied to a tree on that side of the driveway. Did anyone see coming in this morning? Good. That was my plan. Okay. This rope, it goes out the door, alongside the building, behind the garage, to the very corner of the property. I have muddy shoes to prove it. All the way around the, the septic tank, and it's tied to the tree. You'll see it as you leave. 200 yards. This rope signifies our life on earth and our life in heaven combined. 200 yards. This signifies our life here. That tiny little smidgen. If you could see the whole rope played out, it, it's especially striking. 200 yards. And where is our attention? On the three quarters of an inch. This little bit gets 99.9% .9 of our attention. Isn't that insane? To focus only so much on this? Yes, there are tremendous blessings that come in this life, but there's also tremendous struggles and hardships. What do we need to remember? That this ends, and this doesn't. And even more importantly, what's going to be happening during all of this? Paul tells us. He says, we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. During this, we'll be with our Lord. In time, he will call us home and we will see our Savior face to face and we will understand the concept of true love for the very first time. Not only that, we will be reunited with all the believers who've gone before us, whether it's David or Moses or Paul himself or grandma or your dad or maybe your child. In heaven, it'll be nothing but perfect peace because conflict and destruction is a result of sin. There is no sin in heaven. And in heaven, we ourselves will be perfect, even physically. Paul says that Jesus will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. I said this in Bible class a couple weeks ago. I hope that means I'm 6'3", 225 pounds with three cuts right down here. But even if that's not the case, I don't care because, and this is the right word, it will be awesome. That's what this is. And we could go on and on for hours. 
So with that being reality, the question is this. Do you want to trade all that for the cheap trinkets of instant gratification? Well, of course the believer in us says, absolutely not, but how do I do that? How do I make sure I don't lose out on these things? Paul closes with these words. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Paul says, stand firm on God and God's word. And he says, in this way. What is this way? What is Paul's example? To stay focused. Stay focused on the one who came and saved us from ourselves. Stay focused on the Savior who played the long game when it came to our salvation. Stay focused on building up your faith with the tools that God has given you. Stay focused more so on heavenly things than on earthly things. Stay focused and live out the life of delayed gratification, of humble service, knowing that better is coming. And stay focused as you surround yourself with your Lord, with his word, with his supper, and fellow believers. That instead of exchanging all that for the short-lived type of instant gratification, you play the long game of a Christian. The mindset that says, what I have, what I need, I'll have. And my Lord will take care of me until the time is right and he will call me home. And then in every way possible, I will be gratified. Have we sucked up some of what society says? Yes, we have. This was not an easy sermon to write because there was a lot of self-reflection. I kept stopping going, you're talking about yourself there. And maybe it wasn't an easy sermon to hear for that same reason. But like Proverbs says, Iron sharpens iron. Believers build up fellow believers. Paul did that for the Philippians. Paul did that for us 2,000 years later. And I pray that we can all do that for one another. I pray that we lean on and rely on one another for strength to fight against the world's mindset. I want it all and I want it now. And instead follow the believing mindset of, Lord, it's in your hands. However you want to do it is fine with me. May God give us such a faith May God give us such an understanding always. Amen.